all are doing well. A uh, quick announcement, as quickly as I can, we're going to float on the river next week. That's where church is going to transpire. So we're going to uh, meet at our river lot at, what, 930? And we're going to travel from there to Danville, and then we're going to get in the boats, and we're going to float back down to our river lot, and then we're going to have supper or some kind of food to eat, lunch, whatever it's going to be, whatever time allows. It might be mid-afternoon. You're all welcome to be there. If you can't be there to float, you're welcome to come and just break bread. But uh, that's what we're going to do. If you need more details, see someone smarter than me, like Bonnie. Um, we're going to release the kids right now to go downstairs. And uh, we just pray your blessing over them, God. I just ask that you would move in their hearts. We just ask that you bless our children today downstairs. And we're glad you're here this morning. And so is God. Now, if you're new here, we welcome you. If you're old here, we welcome you. If you don't know Jesus, we welcome you. If you've known Jesus for 30 years, we welcome you. My prayer, my heart for you guys this morning, for all of us in here this morning, is experience the power and the presence of God. My prayer is that we go from participators, from, from observers to participators in the kingdom. That we don't just come here to check off a box and get knowledge. Quite frankly, the enemy's not scared of what you know until you do something with it in worship, in power. The scripture says the gospel comes in power. And it's always my prayer that you experience God, the power of God, the actual power, the, man, the manifest presence of God. Do you know that you can do that? And do you know that it doesn't stop here? You can carry that. If the presence of the Lord dwells inside of you, as Scripture says, that's a changer when we go out that door. If for some reason the enemy wants to say, you can have a good emotional experience in church today, but not maintain and carry the presence and the power of God. So where do we start? I want to, I want to submit to you that we start in worship. He says, we enter his gates with praise and thanksgiving. And you might come and say, well, I'm not thankful for anything. Well, are you saved? Can we start there? Is He real to you? Do you know Him? Is salvation really something you own, possess, freedom in Christ, fullness of joy, love, peace, power, joy and righteousness in the Holy Spirit? As it says in Romans, we start there. Maybe you had a battle this week that really stank. God brought you through it. Maybe you... Maybe you're here today with a heavy heart. Something's really weighing on your heart. It's time to say, God, I'm at the end of myself. I'm trying in the flesh to fix this. It's not working. I think oftentimes when God says in His Word, He says, My power is perfected in your weakness. Maybe we should just pray that we get weak so our flesh gets out of the way. So our flesh is just not part of the equation where His Spirit agrees with your spirit, and you begin to see Him as He is. That's my prayer this morning for you, each one in here, that we experience God for who He really is. Satan hates this idea, guys. Please hear me. He hates the idea that you can actually have intimacy with God, that you can talk to Him, that you can hear with Him, that you can dialogue with Him, that, that He can come and, and you can... Hang out with Him in a tangible sense. Listen, it's not a matter of understanding. It, we have to get past our own ways of thinking. The Scripture says, lean not on your own understanding. Sometimes faith requires me to say, I don't understand. God, I don't understand. It doesn't make sense, but I want it. But I know you're there. That's what we ask for this morning as we go into worship. I just want to encourage you. If you're in that place where you've never experienced the presence and the power of God, ask. Ask Him. Listen. He's a, he doesn't force His way down your throat. That's not His nature. He's a gentleman. We're going to go into worship, and, and it's my prayer that you just allow Him to move in you. Allow Him to speak. Allow Him to comfort you. Allow Holy Spirit to teach you, convict you. That's what He does. That's His job, not mine, not yours. 
Let him do his job this morning. Father God, we thank you for your word. I thank you for your presence. And I thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your love. I thank you that we can be thanking you and we will be thanking you for eternity. And that starts today. Thank you that eternity starts today. We just worship you in this place, Lord. We thank you. We praise your name. In Jesus' name. I just went looking for evidence. And I found some in the back. This creation, look at that. Just look at him. Isn't he beautiful? Hi, buddy. Well, I'm going to start teaching now, so I'm going to take this job at the back again. <laughs> this is a little unorthodox start, but if you've been around here for very much at all, you're used to it. We just roll. Thank you for that blessing. God bless you, child. What a beautiful child. I'm just going to ask the Holy Spirit to come in and teach this morning. He's better than it to me. So, Lord, we thank you for your word. We just count on your promises this morning that you're going to be faithful and teach. We look forward to what you have for us, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. So I titled this, uh, this word this morning, and I have the fruit of active faith. And um, I read a lot of scripture, and this is not normal, but I, I had so much scripture that I was like, there's no way we're going to put all this up. And so I'm going to do it different today. Typically we do put up scriptures, but I'm going to do it different today and just kind of tell you in story form and, and relate to what active faith looks like, the fruit of active faith. So, in other words, what I want to get at right out of the box is believing it is a start. Active faith produces a result. If I'm really active in my faith, something happens. There's something tangible. There's change. There's fruit. There's stories. There's miracles. There's healings. There's deliverance. There's change in my heart. There's stories of people getting saved. There's people with stories coming to Jesus Christ through me. Yes? Amen. It's not a pipe dream, church. The fruit of active faith looks like something. It does something. We want to start there. One of my favorite Old Testament dudes was Moses. And we always picture him with, you know, the big white beard and the long staff and everything. He, you, could, you can picture him however you want for the, for the sake of this teaching, this, this word. Um, but he had a lot of, of fruit in his life through active faith, through doing something. And it started out, that he was in Egypt, and I mean, you know the story, like he made his way out into the wilderness, and a burning bush all of a sudden fired up, right? And that kind of probably freaked him out a little bit. And God said, I want you to take my people out of Egypt, I want you to take them to the promised land. Well, right here we, we see the beginning of the, the fruit of active faith. Okay, so obviously he believed in God, because he probably would have ran away from the burning bush, just freaked out. By this time. And so God comes, brings him out into the wilderness, burning bush, and God says, Hey, Bozo, I want you to go back to Egypt and get my people out of there. I want you to take them out. So the first thing that, that active faith will do, point number one, is it's going to draw you at a point of discomfort. It's going to draw you at a point where you're going to have to make a decision. It's going to draw you to a point to do something you do not want to do. Yeah? I mean, anyway, you can testify to that. I can, I can sit here and tell a lot of stories about this ministry. Whew! I said, you know, some of you walked with it through me, and I'm like, I'm scared. I'm terrified. I don't want to do, God, I do not want to do this. God wasn't asking me to. Um, he was telling me to. And when that, my active faith led me to a command of God versus, say, God's making a suggestion, Right? How many of you realize that that happens? That God will take you from a place of belief and faith and take you to the point where He says, I'm not asking you to do this. I'm telling you to do this. This is my commandment to you. Go and make disciples unless you don't feel like it. Go and make disciples unless you're quiet and you can't relate to people. Go and make disciples unless it doesn't suit you because they'll think you're weird. 
the fruit, that, that act of faith at that point says, yes, Lord. Because you're agreeing with the word of God. Belief says, I know I should, I know I might, one of these days, I think I had, I'm going to get the power, well, I'm going to deal with this. Act of faith says, no, I'm going. I'm out the door. As much as I don't want to, I'm going. That's the direction I want to head. Act of faith says yes to God, and then responds by moving in the direction in which he's calling you. What if I get it wrong? Don't worry, you will. Sorry. You're going to make mistakes. Did Moses nail it? Was he obedient? Yes. So he gets to the burning bush, goes back to Egypt, and he's like, okay, we're going to do this thing. And I know a lot of you know the story. So he gathers up the, the, his people, the Israelites, and God says, okay, I'm going to send a whole bunch of plagues, and I'm going to try to get Pharaoh to let you go. He sends, well, how many plagues was it? it was, I forget. It's terrible. Seven or something? Um, Pharaoh, long story short, finally says, okay, we had enough of this clown. Our country's getting wrecked. Our people are dying. We better get him out of here because there's something up with this guy. He's not operating in his own power. So they out. The Israelites head out. And... I think it was what city where they were in Babylon probably or something for the sake of the story. They were in Egypt, but they're moving towards the promised land, the Red Sea, right? And so Moses is heading out. He's got his Israelites, his whole gang, his trucking out of there. And you know the story, the Israelites were actually the Egyptian slaves. They did all their work, and that's what they were. And they were enslaved in bondage in Egypt. And so now the, the Israelites are heading out, and the Egyptians are like, man, oh, wait a minute. Maybe this wasn't a good idea to let our slaves go. How are we going to do our work now? How are we going to get our stuff accomplished? And so what happens? The Egyptians decide to chase after them, if you know the story. They chase after them and say, we want, we, now we want to get them. We changed their minds. How many of you change your mind? Or you live with a woman that does? I mean, whoops, or a husband that does. Oops. So the, the Egyptians are chasing after the Israelites. And the Israelites get up against the, what, the Red Sea. And there they sit. Now, at that point, there has two things leading the Israelites. There was a, a pillar of fire at night. A pillar of fire at night is easy to see, right? Do you ever burn tire at night? You can see that glorious glow. It makes, it makes that just, it's beautiful. We should burn some tires soon. It's neat. It's fun to watch. If you're a dude, you get a kick out of it, maybe. Am I the only one? No. I'm going to get fired. So that's what they had to lead them at night. A fire at night makes what? Light. Right? So then a cloud by day led them by day. That's what the scripture says. A cloud, the cloud by, led them by day. So how many of you know a cloud can't function without light? When it's pitch black at night, do you see clouds? No. The, but if in the middle of the day, on a sunny day, if a nice puffy white ball condensation comes floating across, you see it because it's shaded by the light. And so I think it's kind of a neat prophetic uh, way of, you know, who was light of the world? Jesus. So who was leading the Israelites out of Egypt? Jesus. How was he doing it? By light. Right? During the day, during the night. Here comes the light. Hey, let's go out that way. Right? But it's interesting in the story because when they get to the Red Sea, they start shaking in their boots. And they're like, yeah, hey, Bill, there's a, those guys are mad at us. They are not happy with us at all. There's like an angry swarm of bees. And then here's this thing of water. we got to get across. And I don't know if we have time to build boats. It doesn't look that way. Things aren't looking good. And in that moment, two things happened. Well, a lot of things happened. The cloud went behind them between them and the Egyptians, and so did the pillar of fire, and so did an angel of the Lord, according to the scriptures. So now the thing that was leading them away from Egypt, bringing them out, is all of a sudden behind them. And you're like, wait a minute, I, that thing, that fire and that cloud must guide me out of there, God, and now you shut it off? 
You, you cut it off for me, I can't see it. Now, what are we supposed to go around? What are we supposed to go back? The scripture says this, that that cloud and the pillar and the angel were protecting them from the Egyptians. So they had to park it for the night. They had to sit there. And somewhere in this story, God had said to Moses, listen, when you get to the Red Sea, take your staff, whack the water, it'll part, go right through. And Moses probably be like, yeah, sure. I mean, Moses had seen some pretty wild stuff to, the, to there. He had seen his staff turn into a snake and consume other snakes, burning bushes, talking, burn, talking, burning bushes. I mean, by now, Moses is like, you know what? I think I believe you, God. Because what I've seen you do, what you promised me, has energized what? His faith. So I mean, you know, that the clouds behind them, the pillar of fire's behind them, they need to go this way, and it felt maybe to them like God ghosted them. Have you ever felt like God just ghosted you and just let you, he's quiet, he's not speaking, or he's not active in a problem, or he's just not there? Like, oh God, yo, I'm over here struggling, I'm drowning, I'm, this sucks, help! God's like, I want to propose to you this, that one of the fruits of active faith moves forward knowing what God has already done. Yes? Because active faith produces a system of belief that is undeniable. That it gets to a point where it says, you know what, I've been here before. I can go on from here because I know what happened last time I got up against the wall. I trust God. Moses is going to have to say, you know what, I could shake in my boots and we could all perish here at the hands of the Egyptians. Or I could take my stick like God said, whack the water, Bob's your uncle, we're off and running. You know the story. They make it through. The sea closes behind them, swallows them up, destroys them. They get to the shore. They, when they got to the shore, I think it was cool. I read the story this week. They worshipped and just worshipped and just worshipped the Lord. I mean, they were just hooting and hollering. And that there was, according to the scripture, they're, they're singing songs about their deliverance from Egyptians. And I, I think that's a pretty accurate description of where we worship from, oftentimes, if that makes sense. And I think sometimes our inactive faith produces small worship. Because we don't see God moving. Because we don't believe. And so we don't act. And so it just becomes belief and mundane. And we're observers, not participators. It looks like something. You will have a story to tell. I love this reality. The story gets better and better. And it gets really carnal, man. The, the Israelites were grumpy in the wilderness. They were discontent. I wish Justin Hoffman, who's here, could preach on that because he's really beautiful at it. Someday. They, the, the Israelites came out, and then they worshipped. And now I forget where I was going. You don't know where I was going, do you? Huh? Grumpy. story goes on. Joshua was Moses' nephew and as they got out into the wilderness, years and years and years went by. Moses never made it to the promised land, but he could see it. And he croaked and Joshua's nephew kind of took over Moses' role. And I, I know the faith of Joshua had to be built on watching his uncle Moses do these things over the years and walk in the favor of God and do powerful things. So Joshua goes out and I, I know, Salah, you know the story. They sent Joshua and Caleb into the land where they had to go, and they were shaking in their boots because where the Israelites needed to go, they came back and it was like, there's really big, tall guys over there with big swords and stuff. There's giants. But this is true from the Scripture, and I never realized it till this week, that the giants were as afraid of them as they were of the giants. Why? Listen, when, when freaky God stuff happens, people notice. When seven plagues come and, and screw up a nation, people notice. When God moves, people notice. 
When the Red Sea parts and things go through, I'm, so, I'm telling you what, listen, if the Israelites are watching the Egyptians coming through, the water slams shut, they all drown. The sea, it says, the scripture says this, the seashore was lined up with bodies. And listen, I'm, if, I'm an Egypt, if I'm an Israelite and I'm watching this, I'm going to... Facebook. You gotta see this. Check this out, man. These stinking Egyptians just got toasted, dude. Listen, word traveled back then, not near as fast as it does today, because it traveled. God did something in response to a piece of act of faith. Now there was a story to tell. Now there was a reverent fear of God in the land of the giants, because the giants were like, oh crap. Yeah, we're really tall, but they got God, man. They got they got God. This is a problem. So what's the point? That obedience, all that stuff became a weapon of intimidation against the enemy. In your life, when you stand there long enough and say, no, Satan, no, Satan, no, Satan, no, Satan, no, no, no. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will do what? Flee from you. Sometimes we're shadow boxing an enemy that's not there. Come on. Unless we invite him in and say, I'd like to fight with you today, Satan. In the name of in the name of, oh, I'm being attacked. No, you don't believe. I know, it's like, oh, yeah, you don't know what I'm going through. It doesn't matter. I don't. Do, do you know who God is? Or is it just an idea? And I'll, I'll, in my life, I could tell story after story after story that has built my faith, but it took. A lot of crap. It took a lot of hurt. It took a lot of uncomfort. It took a lot of pain. It took a lot of God exposing my junk. It took a lot. Listen, the gift is free, but receiving it is costly. The gift is free, but receiving it is costly. Yes? If, it's not, if your faith is not costing you something, I, I'm not sure it's accurate. Just gonna be honest. This is not a message to beat you up. This is a message to inspire you. It's always my heart to encourage you into greater measures of faith because that's God's heart. I want to wrap up with this one guy's story. His name is his name was Saul. I know a lot of you know the story. He was in, he was a Pharisee. As he's traveling on the road to Damascus, which I think is kind of prophetic for right now, Damascus. And this guy had all the religion in the world, okay? He knew the Old Testament front to back, cover to cover. He knew it all. So what was he, what was good was his knowledge? Yeah? So he's trucking on the way to Damascus. What's he doing, heading for Damascus to do? To kill Christians. Legit murder Christian and fully endorsed the killing of Christians. So this guy has his religion, he's got his mind made up, he's in just swelled, enveloped in pride, and just saying, you know what, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, I'm going, to, I'm going headed to Damascus to kill Christians, because I've talked myself into them being wrong, and I'm being right. Do you realize how slick the enemy is, and this is true for all of us, that he talked to someone in that knew the Bible better than most people on the planet, into sinning against the very thing that he knew. Pretty sure it said in Exodus that do not kill. I, I read that in somewhere, but this in this guy's pride and his own puffed up knowledge, he's so messed up in his head that he he's doing the very thing that he says he can't. That's for us. I, I, there's places in our lives where we, where we have hidden. Where we think we're doing good, we think we're okay, but we're not. And it takes what? An encounter with Jesus Christ to illuminate that. If you know the story, he's trucking along to Damascus. He's got a couple buddies with him. They're on probably really nice donkeys. You know, maybe a jaguar or something. But uh, all of a sudden, God shows up. Jesus shows up, strikes him down, knocks him off his horse, strikes him blind, and says, Hey, buddy, um, why are you persecuting me? I love Jesus because he's gentle. He could have just whacked him and said, you're out of here. Sorry. How many of you like it, guys would like it if someone committed and started killing your kids? What would you do? 
So Paul has this experience with Jesus. And as he traveled through his life, I believe he looked back on who he was. And it took an encounter with Jesus for him to really demask himself. Paul, listen, Paul would have been one of those fake people. You ever been around a fake person that's just like trying to put on a show? If I'm being honest, that, that would have been his nature, where you have to fake it to make it. Don't let them find, I hope they don't find out what's really inside of me. I hope they don't find out how I am, what I deal with, what I struggle with, my thoughts, my sin, my stuff at home, my stuff in the past, my stuff in my future, my fear, my worry, my anxiety, my depression, my sleepless nights, on and on and on and on. We get a fear, I get a mask, like I can't let anybody know about that stuff. That would destroy me. My pride says, I want them to think this way about my outward appearance, but I can't let them in. That's Paul. Needed an experience with the Lord to say, hey, I want you to take your mask off. I want you to get real. And here's what's real. And it's me. This is my personal opinion from Scripture. Paul talked about his thorn in the flesh. Haunting him. It was a messenger of Satan. This was long after he got saved. It kept coming back. This is my, just my opinion. That I believe that messenger of Satan was a whisper in Paul's ear of saying, You're not as good as you think you are because you used to kill Christians. Remember that? What's one of the enemy's number one pieces of weaponry? Guilt. Shame. Lies. Was Paul guilty of that anymore? Nope. Done. Erased. Gone. So, the fruit of Paul's active faith came from an encounter with the Lord. It demasked him. It caused him to get real. It caused him to understand freedom, love, acceptance. No more shame. No more guilt. No more fear. Nothing to hide from. I'm an open book. I don't have anything to hide. I'm a wide open vessel for you, Lord. Let's go. So, then he wrote... A lot of the New Testament. What's the point? It all came out of an encounter with the Lord. Not teaching, not knowledge, not, I could go on and on and on. It, it came out with a tangible experience with Jesus Christ. That's why we ask so frequently here at West End, Lord, we need you to show up. I, I, we've got to have the presence of God for real, tangible, lasting experience. Anything else is just religion. It's checking off a box. It's watching from the seats versus God saying, hey, I want you to get in the game. Yeah? I want to challenge you guys. What's the last thing God did in your life? And, and are you saying it? I mean, if we're being honest, and we're being real, and He's really here, and we're experiencing Him, and we have faith, and He's working, and He's moving, and He's living, and He's breathing in and through us, then it looks like something. What's the last thing He did, and who did you tell about it? Is that fair? If I ask you what was the last thing you did with your wife, you'd be able to tell me. God's more important than her. Or he should be to you, according to the scripture. I'm not trying to be mean. It's being honest. The scripture says, let the redeemed say so. If I don't have anything to say, who is he? I'm going to wrap up with that. I know that's a challenging word. And if you're sitting there and saying, I don't know. Dan, I don't know. Get right with Him. Just get right with God. Because if that's not happening, if there's not fruit from your faith, the Scripture says many are going to come before me and say, Lord, Lord, I did this, I did that, and I did this, and I did that, and God's going to say, I didn't know you. Go away. And you knew about me. You could sing a song, you could go to church, you could carry your Bible, you could do all those things. All those things are works. He wants you. He doesn't want your works. He wants you. He wants real relationship. And I will guarantee you, 
absolutely 100% ironclad that when it's real, you will have something to say. Guaranteed. You'll have a story to, you, not only will you have something to say, you won't, you'll be itching to talk about it. You will be itching. It will well up in you like you cannot keep it. I don't think you can contain it. I don't think someone can receive the Spirit of God scripturally and not be changed and not be like, oh my gosh, I've got to tell somebody about this. <sighs> you got another song back there, Lord? We're going to worship our way out of here. Um, I want to challenge you with that this morning. What do you have to say? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it sound like? Where's it going to go? Who do you want to tell? And if not, time to get serious. Time to get real. Time to be honest. Maybe you need to go to the road, Damascus, and get your mask off and say, God, I want to be an open book. I'm here for you, not you're here for me. Lord, we thank you for your word. Father, I thank you for challenging us this morning. Holy Spirit, I pray that you dig deep in each one of us. And Lord, we know you're not going to come in shame and judgment, but with conviction. God, I pray that the enemy will not confuse conviction with condemnation in this place this morning. They're separate. But it comes in comfort and, and real and in power, Lord. That you would just speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. seem right for me to preach that and then not offer. Does anybody have a testimony they want to share? A God story? <laughs> anybody got stuff going on? I had a feeling you did. <laughs> That's so cool. I don't know. Go ahead. Um, so as Dan was talking, I could, I could hear as well that I was supposed to share um, how I ended up where I'm at now. Um, through my basically my work um, as most of you know I was at the Nile One Center I've been there for the better part of a decade um, and I thought I was going to be there um, until I retired that was what I liked to do it's what I enjoyed I was good at it um, and then one day out of the blue things changed um, I still enjoyed it but it, it became too much um, and I couldn't figure it out the whole way through there there were a lot of different things that happened along the way. There were obstacles put in front of me um, that, that prohibited me from going where I should have gone or, or where I thought I was supposed to go. Um, and I didn't understand it. But I talked to my brothers here uh, about it, you know, shared my frustrations, that, and, and they just kept encouraging me, just, just be faithful, listen to God. You know, He has a plan for you. Um, even so much to one point in a meeting I was having with a, a few elected officials where I wanted to tell them where the bear goes in the woods. Um, and I could hear, hear the Holy Spirit telling me, just be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. Um, so that's what I did. And I didn't understand it for months. But I stayed faithful. And at the end, and one day, the, the difference just landed in my lap. God put the right people in the right place at the right time. And, and he said, you're, you're going to go here. So that's what I did. I followed that. The other, the other men along the way, they, they followed that. The, they were faithful as well. Listen to what God had to say. And now I'm in a place where I feel like I actually belong. Mm -hmm. A place where everything we do, we, we do to glorify God. Mm -hmm. And, and there's, no, there's no looking back for me. I, I know I'm where I belong. I, I, I know I followed what God told me, where God wanted me to be. And there's been so many blessings out of that already. And, and it's only been a few months. And I can't wait to see what else comes. All right, come on. And, and glorify God for all those things. But that's my story. Amen. Yeah, it was fun to watch. I, I got a front row seat for this one. And uh, this, it was just God, 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 one after the other. It was not easy. Not an easy path. Anybody else have anything they want to share? Anything?
Anything going on? Anything stirring in your heart? Any words? Yeah, I, I do. Andy? Savior, and I share it with everybody. So whatever they want to hear, it's fine, but I pray that they all come to know and enjoy what He has to offer. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Anybody else got anything going? If not, I do. know, but I went on a trip, mission trip to Africa about a month ago. The whole way through this, the part of this year, the beginning, God has put trials and everything in front of not only me and my family, but everybody that went on the mission trip with us. Um, the Satan was just attacking us, saying that he did not want us to go over there to preach his word. And with everything going on here in 